good morning, everyone. This is Lee with Abundant Grace Fellowship here in Keene, New Hampshire. This morning, as we're getting set up, uh, for those of you who are visiting or might be watching this, after this part of the service and things, uh, we'll be doing communion together. It's, uh, I believe, I believe so much in the communion. It's something I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Uh, something that I've adopted not only in our church life, but in my personal life. And so uh, I think it's really important. A couple of things you're welcome to. Uh, somebody asked, do you mind if we share this? You're absolutely welcome to. You can share it off the Abundant Grace page if you happen to be watching it over at Lee Jondro Ministry. Or on my personal page, it will still link back and, and things. Uh, the other thing that um, I wanted to share with you is that a lot of people have been visiting from different places and things. And it's not because, we're, you know, um, it's not because we're advertising it or promoting it. It's simply because uh, it's going out because of people's shares and things like that. The other thing I want, I'm going to share something. I'm looking down at my phone and I apologize. Uh, the other thing is where uh, some have asked the best ways to give and things. If you look at this, uh, I think I got it. So this is an app that I use on my phone. It's called Tithely. It allows me to give. Uh, you can utilize the application itself uh, on Tithely, or you can go right to the website and you can give that way. Obviously, if you live in the area or you want to mail something to us, you're welcome to give by cash or check. And uh, again, God loves a cheerful giver, and I think it's important that we, we maintain that, that uh, giving is part of the process. Uh, just yesterday, I had a gentleman uh, come by, <clears throat> and he met with me, and he wanted to help us with what's going on with the homeless in our in our community and things like that, and uh, came by and, and dropped some money here that will be used for that. So uh, I'll get to that in a few minutes. I want to just take a moment and just welcome each and every person who's here this morning. My name, again, is Lee with Abundant Grace Fellowship here in Keene, New Hampshire, and we, uh, we've been meeting here. This is our third year, and that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning, but I want to open in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for each and every person that, that watches this, this broadcast, this videocast, whatever we decide to call it in this uh, COVID season. Father, this season where we've been put back into our homes on so many levels and things, and I just thank you, Father, that you would bring healing and wholeness to each and every person who watches this, who has a need for it, spiritual life, their emotional life, their uh, physical being. Lord, I thank you that you're the God who heals. And I thank you, Lord, that you just continue to reveal yourself to each and every person here in greater realms. Father, when we talk about faith to faith and glory to glory, Father, what we're really asking is to come into a greater knowledge of who you are. And become more in tune with who you've created us to be and who you've made us to be. So I thank you for that now in Jesus name. Amen. So I, uh, I'm grateful to those of you who, who are joining us this morning. Uh, three years ago, myself and a group of people began to gather uh, to pretty much dwell more in what God's showing us through the gospel of grace now, the gospel is never going to be a part of grace. There is not a gospel, if you will, of legalism or a gospel of impropriety or immorality or lasciviousness or any of those things. It's the gospel and grace are forever married because of the person of Christ who was grace himself. It tells us that grace and wisdom are found in the person of Christ. And so... Three years ago, we began this journey. Uh, it was an unexpected journey. Uh, I wasn't looking to pursue it. Uh, circumstances had been such that I just found myself in the middle of this. And those who know me closely know that, you know, some of my comments were, you know, I, was, I, felt, like I, I felt like as I lay on my couch, you know, God, there's three choices I have. One, I can sit here and do something with this, that you've given me this gift of grace and to continue to propagate it. Or I can go someplace else, but then I have to fight all that legalism that so often 
uh, takes place. People who are stuck in the old covenant, whether it's the prophetic, whether it's their teaching, all those things, we have been, we have been brought from the law. You know, we've been delivered out of that. You know, I continue to desire that you who are watching and those who are close to me, whether it's my family or my friends or people that I meet, that they would come to know who they are in him. Meaning, what is our identity in Christ? That when I look at the Bible, what I'm, what I'm seeing is a reflection of who Christ is in me. And, and, and not to read into it that, you know, things are bad and things are terrible, but things are good. And I'm glad I am who I am in Christ because it's freeing to me to know who I am in him and be able to walk that out. People say, well, yeah, I'm going to demand my ways, but that's not even really what the Bible probably says. First Corinthians, you know, it says love does not push it's not pushy it's not demanding it doesn't it doesn't hammer things down but it allows things to operate through our personal trust in him who uh, is god and so three years ago my third alternative was to sit on my couch and eat bonbons and as As appetizing as that looked and as appealing as that might have been, other than the weight gain and the sugar issues, I realized that God was taking me further into the journey that I began with him some 31 years ago, nearly 32 this year. And so three years ago, I and myself, a group of others, we began to gather. And at some point we chose a name that was Abundant Grace Fellowship Church. <laughs> we had to put the church on the end. And the reason we did was for legal reasons, but it was about the abundance of grace that God has bestowed upon us, about the abundance of grace that he's brought into our lives, about the fellowship we have on a vertical level with God and, and, and an internal level with him who dwells within us, as well as with those about us. And, and so Abundant Grace Fellowship Church began. It began in my living room, and ironically, here we are in year three. Uh, still in my living room some days. Our meeting place, through no fault of theirs because of the COVID issues, uh, was forced to close their conference room where we would gather. And, and so we have been doing this to continue to propagate the message of grace. There's a lot of messages out there. There's better speakers out there. There's better teachers out there. There's better ministry out there. But the message of grace continues to resonate in my heart. And, and with that, I, I, I look at people on a daily basis who are caught up in the, the, the trappings, if you will, of religiosity of the things that lead to uh, a denigration of those about them, a demeaning of others. And none of that is in keeping with the gospel. None of that is in keeping with the goodness of God. Uh, I said last night that the gospel of grace really came down to this, which is simply to believe God and walk in love and do the things that God has asked of you. There's no simpler message out there. There's an approach from God and there's a response from man. So three years ago, we began to gather. And for me, it was nothing and continues to be nothing that I ever sought after. My early days of being in the church uh, I began a ministry that took care of the homeless and was out on the streets meeting with people and we preached the gospel, but we brought blankets and food and made relationships in our community with those that were less fortunate. And 
we we sought them out to the place where even some of the police who work nights when someone was found drunk or not in danger of dying but was under the influence of alcohol and or drugs they would come over to us and say hey you know there's a guy over there in that little alcove there or that little alleyway and you might want to go talk to him and because the opposite of that would be that they would have to pick him up him or her and put them in jail so that was the beginning of my ministry if you will that i felt and it began very evangelistically uh and 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 things and then I, I went from there i began in another church and i carried that ministry with us um again it was in our home we took people that were uh what we call what i call pmp simply uh, it was people who were on probation people who had been in prison and didn't have great lives and i would build relationships with those men there were women but there were men in, in predominantly and they came to work for me in many cases and they came to live with my wife and i and our two children who were living in that home at the time and we we had powerful things happen we saw god meet needs we saw god deliver people from lifestyles we saw god deliver people from the brokenness of their experiences and come into communication with others um People have asked me many times over the years, did you ever have a worry about that? Maybe I was naive, maybe I was ignorant, but I didn't. Um, and, you know, I, I'm pretty sure if my wife was concerned about any one of the men who lived with us over those years, she would have been the first to tell me. And so we went from there and then just as things were starting to change, um, God allowed this circumstance that came to me to move and i began with a prayer room when where we moved we moved 45 miles from where we met and were married and started in ministry and we came into this community and i and i felt like god wanted me to open this prayer room and i really didn't have an agenda for it other than prayer but a few months in god said i want you to open in quotes and i'm using the word in quotes because i don't use church but he wanted me to open a fellowship and that fellowship began to blossom and it began to change and it began to do a lot of things and through that that experience um some good some bad uh you know, I, I, I began to understand things. I began to understand people and a little better than I had. And when we, we started Abundant Grace Fellowship here three years ago, my experiences, not bad or good, but just my experiences, I didn't want to do what I do today. But I felt like God was telling me that he would partner with me and walk with me and others throughout this experience. And so I want to share a few things this morning uh, that are related to this. You know, in, in the world, there's a significance to the number three when it comes to anniversaries. And, and, and the gift, if you will, for a third anniversary is leather. I don't totally understand that reasoning or that thought process, and I'm not pursuing it. But I looked at it from a spiritual perspective. I thought about the girdle that was worn by Elijah and, and worn by John the Baptist. I thought that, you know, I would read through the Bible that leather was employed or implemented for clothing and for writing upon the papyrus that so many things were recorded on, were recorded on leather. And so there's something to be said for where we are at coming into this third year, that there is a writing that is to come. I'm not speaking as we're going to birth a whole bunch of creative writers, though that can happen. But, but I think there's a writing, there's an establishment of what's being done that is being recorded that is being brought together. There are things in people's lives as they've been with us for three years that have shifted and changed. And, and 
I said when we started three years ago, the people that are here are not always going to be with us at some point. And I used the word three years. I said within three years, there's going to be a handful of you who are not part of what we're doing. It's not because we don't want you or you don't want us. It's because that's what God's doing. When, when we formed, I think some people would say they did it out of hurt or they did it out of anger. My wife would tell you I chased after God to make sure that I was this way about it, that I wasn't angry and I wasn't coming out of a hurt place. And I wasn't coming out of a place of disappointment or discouragement, but I was coming out of a place of faith that this God is what you want us to do. And so the leather carried on, um, and I think of Simon the Tanner, who, who lived um, on the ocean, if you will. It says Peter, you know, we, we, many of us know the story of Peter seeing the sheet come down and all these unclean animals and the interpretation that he was to go outside of his culture and go meet with the heathen, go meet with the infidel, go meet with those that were not Jewish. And, and so he goes and he spends time with Simon the Tanner. Uh, I'm reading a book right now, unrelated, but it has to do with people who live on a pig farm. And they talk about the smell and, and they talk about the work and the toughness and all those things. And if you go study tanning of hides, you realize that the smell was terrible. The tanning of hides. Paul was a tent maker. Tents were made outside the community because of the smell of, and I'm going to use the word chemicals. It wasn't like they took all these chemicals, but they took things that they had to, to, to soften and make these hides pliable and 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 to clean them up and bring them to a place where they were workable and they could be used for the tents that Paul might build. So here's Peter. He goes down and he sees uh Simon the Tanner and I believe the town was Joppa. It was a place on the water and he went there and and I can only think that as he was there and you know he had that whole vision <clears throat> of uncleanness that he was being called to walk out into. When Tina and I were brought to a community many years ago, uh, this job came up for me and called my wife and I told her that it was being offered to me. And she goes, oh yeah, that's the place. And I'm like, babe, you do realize this is the armpit of the state. And I heard the Lord say, and I'm bringing you to be the deodorant. And much like that statement that I felt the Lord said to me, uh, here's Peter going to Joppa and, and meeting with Simon the Tanner. And what's he learning? He's learning that there's going to be things that aren't going to be pleasant. And there's going to be things that aren't going to be cool. And there's going to be things that, that just offend him, if you will. But love doesn't take offense. And, and the gospel was brought to reach all mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe upon him, would have eternal life and so there was the smell and there was the odor and it was by the water it was by the sea and all those things that i think we're looking at in the coming year that there are going to be people that if a f that would under unloving circumstances would bring offense to us and God is going to grace us in greater realms to meet with those people. He's going to grace us in greater realms uh, to be, I'm going to use the word bold, but when I use the word bold, people think I think you've got to stand out and yell at people. And yes, that's what I used to believe. That's not what I believe. But boldness is walking in. Yesterday, I spent time with my grandson, Jacob, and we talked about peacemaking circumstance that that you know has happened and how we walk through that we can have peacekeepers where which are not in the bible we can have peacemakers who are in the bible and the bible tells us that blessed are those that who are the peacemakers for they will be called the sons of god and so three years ago i sat on our couch and 
And I remember the last message I preached in my previous place. And I remember the first message I preached when I moved, you know, and, and I, I labored to walk out of that place because many, many years ago, a, ge a gentleman named John Chacha came into my life and he talked about uh, leaving a place in a healthy manner so you can enter into a place in a healthy manner. And he talked about the difference between a birth where the child is birthed head first, which doesn't destroy the mama. And he talks about a breach birth. And he was saying that how you leave, you don't want to destroy the place you came from. And you want to bless that place. So when you come into the new place, what you went out of in blessing is that you would come in in blessing. And so I labored before we came to this place of Abundant Grace Fellowship to make sure that those things were in order. I remember talking about the baby being born, and I, and I shared the story of what John Chacha shared. Uh, and, and I told people that there were things that were going to happen here, that were going to carry on, that were going to continue to be life-changing. And so over the years, we've done good and godly things. We, you know, our, 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 the, the ministry that several do to the homeless, including the gift giving that we give directly to the homeless shelter. The people we minister to are, are the, the missionaries that we minister to and give to, uh, and as well as uh, the recovery ministry that we participate in. And, and I look at those things. And I say, we've had this opportunity to make changes. And so what's change, God? And, and I think all too often, the change is on the inside be, before it becomes externalized. I know for me that in my studies almost weekly, there's something that I believed prior to the moment of that week. And now I'm forced to have what we call repentance or metanoia, which means I got to change my mind about my approach to it. And so I look at those things that have changed and I don't always see all the changes, but I see the ones that are pertinent. I see the ones that I think represent the gospel, if you will, that people are beginning to understand. You know, when Paul says, beloved, I desire that you would prosper and that you would be in good health, even as your soul prospers. I, I hope and believe that um, when people give, they give it through an area of cheerfulness. They give cheerfully because they believe in what God's doing. Yes, it opens the doors to great things. Yes, it changes the financial demeanor of a ministry or people's lives. But it's something that that is the heart of God, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's not asking you or I to give uh, in that realm, but he's talking about time and talent and treasure and, and, and stewardship and all those things. And, and some of those things are, are, are better and some of those things because of COVID uh, are difficult, but I, but I feel like uh, those things are really important. And, and, I, and, I, and I feel that, you know, some of the things that have changed, you know, years ago, I said, uh, it, three years ago, I said that the table of the Lord was going to become famous. And within a month, two very, very prestigious ministers, and then began to share they had never talked about it before in everything that I could find or research. But all of a sudden, they're talking about the table of the Lord. And the table of the Lord became famous. Now, I'm grateful that the Lord shared that with me. But there's been things that I've said that I'm not, well, let me say, I, I don't want to say I'm not grateful. But it's hard when I know what's going to happen. You know? Uh, the elections would be one of those things. Even three years ago, I was looking at some of my notes. You know, the elections became very, very contentious and people were picking sides and, and all that all that stuff. God doesn't pick sides. He's not picking sides. And, you know, so I, I thought about 
three years and I thought about the Trinity and the revelation of number three, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I thought about how many times three operates through, through the Bible and the pattern. So I believe that this year is going to be a powerful year for Abundant Grace Fellowship. I believe that we're going to see an increase in so many areas. We're going to see music that's coming through us, that's going to start touching places that haven't been touched and people that haven't been touched. And it's not going to be just because it's music. It's going to be because it carries the heart of the Father. And, and, and that's not to say other music doesn't carry the heart of the Father. I'm only talking about what I see happening in this coming year. So those who are on our music team, you know, we, we've tried to figure this whole thing out. How do we do this and bless those people? So I think we're coming up with a plan and we're going to see other teachings and people who are part of our fellowship are going to start sharing. Sometimes it's maybe an interview with me or someone else interviewing them, or sometimes it may just be the Lord's giving them a message about something, you know, a, a message that is key in keeping with love and grace and kindness and mercy and all those things, not something that, you know, is going to drive people away. Because there's an invitation that comes. There's an invitation that comes with this cup. There's an invitation that comes with this bread. There's an invitation to people to sit at the table and begin to uncover what their true identity is in him who made them. And so I look at the leather and I, and I think, you know, I think about how they wore leather and it was to protect them from the weather and it was to protect them from the elements and it was to keep them safe and it was to keep them warm. And I think that, you know, in the coming year, the, the, the anniversary of leather is going to give protection to those who embrace it because everything needs to be embraced, right? For it to be value, there's things that, yeah, they can pop and they can happen. But so much of what happens in the kingdom is because someone believed. <clears throat> you know, so I said that, you know, many years ago, we were going to see people who I called spiritual refugees, people that had gone through really dark and difficult times. Some of my best meetings in my week are people who are not in church, who are not in the church, who are not in abundant grace. And the reason those meetings are good, because I see how their thinking is. And I'm like, so where did we miss that? Or how do we do that? And uh, one, of the, one of the men I meet with, he and I are going to be looking at doing a podcast. It's going to have to do with things that are happening in, in you know, like, you know, he and I talk about social media and we talk about politics and we talk about the community and we talk about finances and we talk about, we're going to share it. He's, he's much younger than me. And, you know, that's going to be something that we're going to do. I've begun doing things with my grandson and what started out to be related to old and new technology. What I'm finding is there's things that are being shared. Why, you know, why do I believe? So as we look at a piece of vinyl, you know, uh, you know, we're looking at a record jacket or something. What is it? Why? Why was that important in the 60s? Yeah. You know? And I, I put up this post yesterday. You know, it said, uh, you know, I love my vinyl collection because whoever asked you to look at your MP3 collection, you know, there was there was artwork and there was creativity and there was information. And now it's become historical you know, that could be found on the covers of record jackets and, you know, on, on record jackets themselves. So I find myself sharing with Jacob those kind of things. And I think that we're going to find, you know, that we're one generation. It's not about generations. It's about, a, you know, a royal priesthood, a holy generation. And, and so, you know, when I, when I and others began, I said, we were going to, we were going to preach a gospel of grace. You know, we were going to carry forward the message of grace. And some people consider that scandalous. And some people feel that people get away with things and people, you know, that's not right. If you just only treat people right, they're just, if you, if you never do anything, you know, if you never discipline them in quotes or chase them down, how are they going to change? Bible tells us that it's the goodness of God that draws man to repentance. It's not the punishment of God. So over the years, we've seen love for one another. You know, we, we've seen growth in loving and giving and reaching others. And we've seen change. 
you know, and I, and I continued and I know that we're going to continue to see people stepping up and people growing, you know, people's gifts are going to grow. And as I said, you know, then the table will become famous and we're going to see another surge. And, and I don't want it to be a surge that just peters out, you know, like a tsunami. It comes in and everybody goes, ah, take the table of the Lord. And then it goes back out to sea. I don't want that to happen. You know, uh, I said that people were going to start moving here. And there's been some shift in that. Yeah, COVID changed some things, but there's, there's something uh, to be said for that. I think there's a reviving of, of, of hearts and of spirit. And, and, I, and I think those things are really, really important that, you know, lives are being changed. You know, I, I tell people all the time, we don't prophesy death and destruction and, and doom and gloom. There's enough people out there doing it. And, 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 you know, it's not because I want to be, the, you know, the opposite of what they do, but I, you know, I, I'm looking to see what grace does and what mercy does and what kindness does and what love does. You know, as I enter into, you know, my 66th year and 32 years of being in ministry, and I think back about how I got here and what is changing and what needs to change in my life and, and the things that I do. I, I want to embrace it further. So abundant grace is going to continue. I said, in, you know, that the, the title, if you will, three years and counting, um, there's not a countdown, there's a count up, uh, that people's lives are going to be changed for the better. The grace, the, gr the message of grace, not the grace message, because all messages should be about grace and or teaching that's in keeping with mercy and kindness and love and grace. But all too often people go, oh, that's that grace church. Well, I would think that the Bible would share with us and show us and that all of us need to be in grace. And, and, and I don't think some of that's really subject to interpretation. I know that a lot of things that are said in the Bible can be subject to one's interpretation, to one's understanding. But the more, you know, but, but as I look at people who are my age and older, the more I see those changes, you know, and people are like, oh, I remember when we would, and I'm like, and I cringe because that's not my message today. And, and my message today is that we love one another and that we, we, we grow together and we share lives together and we encourage one another in our journey. I think that we would probably find that people would be more willing to share with friends and family if we were encouragers to those people. If we took the time out to encourage people to grow in the spiritual gift that God has made them. Because it tells us that each one of us is a gift. Each one of us has been made a spiritual gift. And yet I look around and I know people, I said this yesterday, I've seen hundreds of words over individuals. They go to a meeting and bam, you're a teacher, you're a whatever, doesn't matter. And they go, yeah, and they take it. And they go, that was a really good word. I'm glad I went to that meeting. And they fold it up and they put it on the shelf. And then they track down another meeting. And they go in that meeting. And someone else will come up and say, every time I see you, there's the gift of pastoral on you. And they panic. And then they take that word and they go, and they put it aside. I called it the sock drawer yesterday. But for some people, it's kind of like the junk drawer. Probably every family has a junk drawer of some sorts. And, you know, and you always paw through because you remember that, you know, you put something in there a million years ago. I think God wants to breathe on these this year. You have a spiritual gift. You are a spiritual gift. And, and God is desirous that you would begin to walk in that. So what is it you need? If you're in our fellowship of abundant grace, how do I encourage you? If you're not, and you don't have a place to go, or you know, you're trying to figure out the rhyme and the reason, reach out. Reach out. You don't have to reach out to me directly. You can reach out to people that, you know, are part of what we do. What is it that God's calling you to do? Because 
we can look at all the division that happened in the last year and all the divisiveness that came and the sides and the name calling and all all the stuff where people began to believe you know uh, things that you know and they elevated them above god himself god says blessed are the peacemakers and everybody runs and they go you did that to me and you did that to me and where are the men and women to step into the middle of that and go whoa baby told Jacob yesterday about this circumstance that peacekeeping is easy. Anybody can be a peacekeeper, but it's not in the Bible. Anybody can go, oh, you know, no big deal. But it takes a lot to walk into the midst of division and say, I'm going to be a bridge. I'm going to be a bridge, abundant grace fellowship, because it's made up of people who are beginning to understand or maybe already understand I'm going to be a bridge. It's easy to go hang out with your tribe. It's easy to go hang out with people and put your head in the barrel and hear everything that you want to hear. But it's not so easy when someone comes with a message that's different or opinion that's different or a thought process that's different. Yesterday, again, because Jacob and I were hanging out so much, I was talking about Martin Luther King. You know, and and I was talking about, you know, I grew up in the 60s. Well, I didn't grow up, but you know, I was raised in the 60s. And it was a turbulent time. You know, we had our own pandemic going on. And we had, you know, and it was great division in our country. And some of it was bound in race. And some of it was bound in the military and love and all those things. You know, we were, you know, for whatever reason, we were called you know, it was the, you know, it was the summer of love, and there was the generation of love, and, you know, and all those things. God had a part in that. He may not have caused people to do all the drugs and stuff that they did, but he had a part in that. He had a part or a piece in the love thing, because God himself is love, so he's invested. He's invested in it. He's not going anywhere. And so as I look to what's happening in the coming days, I envision great change for good. People go, oh, I don't know how that's going to happen or it's all going to hell in a handbasket. As long as we keep speaking those words, we're going to live in those words. God is not going to come down and take authority over people who want to keep division up in the air who want to keep the balls of discord up in the air he's waiting for men and women and children to come along and say stop this is not how we do it how we do it is we love one another and we give grace to one another well, what do you do when somebody does something wrong you sit down with them and you have real conversations Hardly a week goes by that I don't find myself in a circumstance where I either have to sit between two people or there's a friend or a family member or something that's going through a really tough time or they're acting out in bad ways. You know, the church has covered up a lot of stuff over the years. You know, we... We, you know, do I understand the scripture that says love covers a multitude of sin? I absolutely do. But that does not mean that it's like picking up the rug and sweeping it underneath. What it means is we overlook some things and we focus on the things that are important. How do we get the gold that is within somebody? How do we uncover that through the muck and the mire and the dirt? that holds that nugget of gold that's within their life, that identity that God made them to be. It's going to take an effort. But the effort is worth it because communities will change and lives will be changed. And hope will arise in the midst of all these things. Love covers a multitude of sins, but it doesn't discount sin. And it doesn't just say, you know, 
it, it sits down and it has real conversations. Well, what do you do if they did something against the law? That's a whole nother topic because I'm not the law. And I don't mean I'm the law versus grace. I'm not the law. If somebody has done something illegal, then it probably needs to be reported. But the church can't cover those things up just because, you know, maybe the person was a great giver in the church or any of those things. I've seen the damage. I've seen the destruction. I've witnessed it. Abundant grace, fellowship, an outpouring of grace abundantly to bring us into fellowship both with God and man, that we might be the church and do what we're called to do. One of the things that I brought with us to Abundant Grace was the table, the cup, the bread, and the power of the table. I sit here when no one's around and I take the cup and I take the bread and I'm reminded of my relationship that when I do it I think of you know sister Sally or brother Joe or whoever it is I think of the children I think of the families that would be united if they understood the powerful statement the powerful revelation that accompanies the bread and the cup if they understood that, that, you know, I, I, I've said over the last few months, I see that there are people that in our Abundant Grace Fellowship family who are going to begin to take the table out to the road, out to the street. Well, Lee, that's goofy. Okay, that's goofy. But you know what? I think it's God. Well, I don't agree with you. That's fine. That's fine. But when I run into people who have been kicked out of the church because they got divorced or something, do I believe in divorce? Absolutely not. Anybody that knows me knows that, you know, when I, when I see the scriptures about divorce, I know where God's heart is. But I also recognize that those things happen. Doesn't mean God's in them. And, and, and I mean that God's not orchestrating that. I'm simply saying that God is bringing life and love. And not everybody can accept that. And not everybody, is, you know, is going to resist that. And that's okay. But I think our families would be better. And I think our friendships would be increased for the betterment. And I think that our church gatherings would be more fulfilling if we understood the value of the cup and the bread. So that's what we're gonna do. Jesus sat with his disciples. He sat in a room full of people. As I sit here and get ready to do this, there are people who are gonna pick up their bread and they're gonna pick up their cup. And I sit here with you. And I sit here with each one of you. And, and, you know, and, and, and just like Jesus sat with his disciples, I'm not saying I'm Jesus and you're the disciples. I don't mean that on any, by any stroke of the imagination, but just as Jesus sat and he began to do communion or take communion with his brothers, that's what I'm doing. So on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he looked at his disciples and as he took it and he distributed it. He said, this is my body. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. And he was speaking to them, but he was speaking to us. Every time we do this, it's a reminder of the greatness of God. The price that was paid by the stripes, we are healed. And even the wondrousness of the taking of the bread or the cracker itself that just even as the the catholic church believes you know up until like 500 you know ad there was the, the the catholic church which means the one church they believed that life healing and wholeness was in the bread 
And so I believe in my own body that there's a wondrousness that comes into my life. I believe that we are manifesting the healing that needs to come. The healing of hearts, the healing of minds, and the healing of bodies. And the reminder that we are the body of Christ. That wherever we live, when we do this, we're bringing that connection back into life. And in like fashion, he picked up the cup. And he took it and he said, this is my blood. And each time I drink this blood, I'm reminded. Each time I drink this cup, the wine, the juice, I'm reminded of the shed blood of Jesus that eradicated the sin of the world. I'm reminded that you and I have entered into a new covenant, a covenant of life, a covenant of resurrection, a covenant of goodness and mercy and grace, a covenant of love. And I thank you, Jesus, for it. There are good things on the horizon, great things on the horizon. Each one of us is going to see a manifestation. You know, we talk about the token or the earnestness, you know, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit left behind a token or left behind an earnest deposit that, you know, God made in the earth that exists today. And that token, if you will, that earnest deposit, if you will, is available for those of us who believe in the manifestation of that. And so as a, I close today, I invite you, if you didn't take the cup, consider it. If you have found that you've beat yourself up over the things that you've done or the hurts and the pains and the bitterness, that others have manifested towards you. This is the day of forgiveness. This is the day of hope. This is the day of love. I understand what it's like to be hurt. I understand what it's like to be instructed to forgive. But I figured out a long time ago that forgiveness opens doors and gratitude opens doors and walls that I didn't even see. So, Father, for each person that listens to this, Lord, bless them abundantly. Lord, let their lives be made better today because of the knowledge of you and who you've made them to be. Father, I release a great blessing over each person, Father. You know, I, I, Jesus said, be blessed. Be blessed. Walk in the blessing that you are. Walk in the blessing that he's made you to be. And so with that, I just thank you for being here. I love you. Uh, I tell people if you don't have someone in your life just to reach out to pray for you. Uh, myself, others are always available, uh, willing to pray. You know, and, and we, have a, we have a Facebook group. And every time I put up something, I can see who looks at it, and who answers. But every time I put up a prayer request, just the other day, a uh, spiritual dad of mine uh, was sent to the hospital with COVID. You know, his wife reached out and asked people to pray. I know we were one of hundreds and thousands. But it just blessed me to see all the people in our fellowship just begin to pray. And I was even more blessed when just a few hours later, he was released from the emergency room and sent home with some medication. So, Father, just bless each and every person. Thank you for being with us. Uh, may your week just be amazing. If you're a Super Bowl aficionado, I hope your team wins. That sounds weird, right? Because some of you are going to be Kansas and some of you are going to be New England. I mean, Tampa. <laughs> so just have a great day, regardless of what you do with it. Be with family, be with friends, and know the Lord loves you. Thank you.